Uh, can everybody hear me now? Can everybody hear me now? Sometimes I really hate technology. I really do. All right, all praise to the most high. Can I get a brother to scribe for me? Brother Scrap, I'm gonna read the disclaimer again. Israel United in Christ, we are not a hate group. We are not affiliated with any other Israelite group. Israel United in Christ is a non-violent Bible-based movement. We do not advocate or condone any acts of violence against any race, ethnicity, or gender. We advise that if anyone hears and knows of any plots to cause harm to anyone or to break the laws of the land, you must contact the proper authorities to bring awareness to any possible threat, as stated in Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. All right, so today we're going over 2 Samuel chapter 9 through 12. Um, it's, a, it's a short day, so I'm going to start reading immediately since we lost a little time anyway. All right, and it said, 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 1. Do I have a brother to scribe? If any brother can scribe, just jump in when you can. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Remember, Saul, Saul's son Jonathan and David were always very close. Let's go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3. It's not 2 Samuel 9 and 12. It's 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse uh, through 12. Chapter 9 to chapter 12. And I'm reading at 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 1 right now. Jumped over to 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 3 of Saul and Jonathan. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 3 is, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. So remember, in the book of uh, Samuel, the beef that was going on between Saul and David, Jonathan was always there for David. That was David's homeboy. They were, they was really, really close. All right. Uh, back to second Samuel chapter nine, verse two. And there was of the house of Saul, a servant whose name was Ziba. And when he called him unto David, the king said unto him, art thou Ziba? And he said unto, and he said, thy servant is he. And the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. I mean, he couldn't walk. And the king said unto him, where is he? All right, am I still here? All 
All right. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Makir, the son of Amiel of Lodabar, in Lodabar. Then the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Makir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and all, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. So because of Jonathan, because of the the respect and the love that he had for Jonathan, um, David was going to show kindness to Jonathan's son. Jonathan's son, he couldn't walk. So to show the love for Jonathan, David gave everything that Saul owned to Jonathan's son. All right. Verse eight. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou shalt that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants, which goes to show you the... The level of um, the level of riches that we had as a nation, the level of riches that we had as a nation. The level of, um, the, level of the, the riches that we had as a nation, we our servants were able to have servants themselves. Remember, the bottom of the verse 10 says. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So Saul's servants had servants. That's how wealthy this man was. And those servants and all of his sons, Ziba's sons, were going to till the land and take care of the house for Mephibosheth, which was Jonathan's son. All out of respect that David had for Jonathan. Uh, verse 11. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. So because of the love and admiration that he had, this is what we need to bring back into Israel. We need to have this same love and care and admiration for the people that we lose, because we do lose people in Israel. It's uh, very unfortunate, but we need to take care of their family as if they were there themselves. We have to show that same love that David had. That's why the Lord said David is a man after his own heart. David loved his people so much so that he made sure that even though things may have not gone well between me and Jonathan's father, I still had enough love for Jonathan to take care of his seed, his son, and to make sure that his family is grounded and established in Israel. Chapter 10, verse 1. And it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanun his son reigned in his stead. Then said King, then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanun, the son of Nahash, and as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father, and the king and David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. Now remember, the children of Ammon was warring with Saul. They were warring with Israel. Then it got smashed, and then Saul was made king when you go back to 1 Samuel. So when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 11, let's go there real quick. First Samuel chapter 11. Chapter 
chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It said, Then Nahash, the Ammonite, came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash, the Ammonite, answered, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust all out all your eyes and lay a for reproach upon all Israel. So they was very disrespectful to us, especially towards the in, in the beginning of the reign of Saul. But they got smashed and they got put under tribute just like everybody else. So um, when these things happened, you know, of course, they have to be underneath us. So David said, you know what? I'm going to send and I'm going to I'm going to bring comfort to them and let them know, look, I'm the new king, this, that, and the third. Watch what happens. Verse 3. 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 3. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanun their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he had sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So through one generation to another, they still have this beef with Israel. Through one generation to another, they still have it in their mind. Look, these people are our enemies. They not meant to... They're not meant to be at peace with us. We're not meant to be at peace with them. So what they started to do was put it in the king's mind like, look, you think he really going to send some comforters over here to, to, to give you comfort? He coming to spy the land out. He coming to try to overthrow us. Just like the wars that we had with Saul and them before, that's what David is trying to do. That's what they put inside the king's mind. Verse 4. Wherefore, Hanun took David's servants and shave off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even unto their buttocks and sent them away. So one of the things that we first learn when we come into this truth is that a man has to have a beard, that men have to pull up their pants. This is the some of the things that we first learn when we come into the truth. Why? I'm going to read the verse again. Verse four. There, wherefore Hanun took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards. It is a shame for a man to shave his beard off. That's why he did that to them. Your beard is a badge of manly dignity. It is a law given to us by the Most High God. He said that they shaved off the one half of their beard. So all of this, just imagine all of this is just gone. And I got one half of my beard on my face. I would be ashamed to come into the city. And then they cut off their garments in the middle, even unto their buttocks. So they cut their garments to where their behind was showing. And nowadays we got brothers that's walking out here every single day, showing off their behind like it's normal. This is a shame. This, these men were ashamed when this thing happened. Watch verse five. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, tarry here at Jericho, tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, then return. They didn't even want to go into the city. David didn't want them in the city. Look, when your beards grow back, then y'all come back. Why? We don't want that in Israel. That's not supposed to be. Now, granted, some of us uh, do the captivity. Some brothers, they, they work at plants and, you know, they have to shave their beard off and stuff like that. Or they have to fight to at least keep uh, within regulation, I believe it's like a fourth of an inch or a half of an inch or something like that. They have to fight in order to keep what little beard they have. But this right here, we were we were the ones that was in power. So to shave off the one half of somebody's beard, that was not something that was that was good. And to have your behind showing is not something that's good either. These men were greatly ashamed to have their garments cut to where their behind was showing. Right now, we got men walking around with their behind showing as a fashion statement. That's not good. That's what we have to change as a people. Verse 6. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen of the king Maacah, a thousand men, and of Ash Ishtab, 12,000 men. So once these men saw that David didn't like what happened, 
guess what? They knew, okay, David is a man of war. The Israelites, they're a people of war. All right, we need to get some help. But let me show you something. Go to uh, uh, one chapter, well, two chapters over. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 11. Let me show you this real quick. Which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold, which he had dedicated of all the nations which he subdued. Watch what it say. Of Syria and of Moab and of the children of Ammon and the Philistines and of Amalek and the spoil of Hadadezer and of Rehob, king of Zobah. So David already had these men in subjection. David already subdued these men. So what they try to do is they try to get the same men that's always been beefing with us and they try to get them to come against us yet again. Now watch what happens. Second Samuel chapter 10. We're going to read verse six again. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David and the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Horab. Or Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen. And the king, uh, King Maacah, a thousand men, and of Ishtab, twelve thousand men. And when David heard it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the, at the entering of the gate of the Syrians of Zobah. And Rehob and Ishtab and Maacah were by themselves in the field. And when Joab saw that the front of the battle was against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice and put them in array against the Syrians and the rest of the people. He delivered into the hand of Abishai, his brother, that he might put them in array against the children of Ammon. So David's mighty man, David's mighty man, what happened was he got Joab. Joab got Abishai. What they started to do was they started to put their put their troops in a battle array. So you got Ammon on one side, and you got the Syrians on another side. So Joab took some men and put them against the Syrians. Abishai took some men and put them against Ammon, so that they can fight two people at one time. This is how much of a warrior nation we are. We got warrior-like mentality we have these things already etched inside of us we just have to keep the commandments so that thing can come back out because it is going to come back out according to joel chapter 2 verse 10 and the rest of the people he delivered into the hand of abishai his brother that he might put them in array against the children of ammon and he said if the syrians be too strong for thee then shalt thou shalt help me but if the children of ammon be too strong for thee then I will come and help thee. So it's like, look, if you get overtook on this side, just come join with me. We're going we gonna, we gonna to handle it. If I get too strong on that side, come join with me and we're going to handle it over there for you. This is that warlike mentality. Verse 12, be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God. And the Lord do that which seemeth him good. And Joab drew nigh and the people that were with him unto the battle against the Syrians, and they fled from before him. So they started to whoop the Syrians yet again. Once it comes out that the Israelites start to fight, when the Lord is with us, we don't lose. We don't lose. No matter how many times they try to rise up, you saw in chapter 8 that David was collecting tribute from all of them, silver, gold, everything. And then they're going to try to rise up again just because they thought that they had some help think twice verse 14 and the children of Ammon saw the Syrians were fled and they fled they then they then fled they also before Abishai and entered into the city so Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem so they the Ammonites fled and the Syrians fled why because David's mighty men handled up on them it wasn't no getting around that. You're not about to just get around that. And when the Syrians saw that they were smitten before Israel, they gathered themselves together. And Hadarezer said, 
and sent and bought out the Syrians that were beyond the river. And they came to Helam and Shobak, the captain of the host, and Hadareza went before them. And when it was told David, he gathered all Israel together and passed over Jordan and came to Helam. And the Syrians set themselves in array against David and fought with him. And the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots of the Syrians and 40,000 footmen, uh, 40,000 horsemen, and smote Shobak, the captain of their host, who died there. And when all the kings that were servants unto Hadarezer saw that they were smitten before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. So this is what happens when you mess with the children of Israel. When you mess with the armies of the living God, you get whooped. They got whooped so bad that the Syrians is like, you know what? We're not even helping Ammonites no more. We're not even helping y'all no more. If y'all need some help, go look somewhere else. Because don't, don't come over here looking for help because we're not helping y'all no more. <laughs> oh, you got to love being an Israelite. Chapter 11. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when the kings go forth to battle that David sent to Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbi. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass that in an evening tide that David arose from off, from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look on. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned to her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, I know a lot of uh, Masons and a lot of people that are in like these different fraternities. Whenever you start to correct them with the scriptures, this is where they go. They always go to King David. Well, King David slept with Bathsheba. Well, King David did this with Bathsheba. And, and, and the Lord still forgave him. You ain't King David. You're not even you you're not even close to King David. King David was a man just like the rest of us and he messed up. And this is the the this is the mess up. But a lot of them if if any of y'all talk to a lot of them them fraternity people, a lot of them, a good percentage of them, I'm going to say 90% of them go right back to David and Bathsheba. Every time they want to justify some wrongdoing that they're doing, they go to David and Bathsheba. Every single time. It never fails. Second Samuel 11 and 6. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come in unto him, was, was come unto him, David demanded of him. Now Joab. Oh, how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. So David was asking a report of the war from a guy whose wife he just had sex with. And David said unto Uriah, go down to thy house and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all his servants of his Lord and went not down to his house. And when they had told David saying, Uriah went not down to his house, David said unto Uriah, camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thy house. So what David's plan was, and nobody was privy to it, what David's plan was, yeah, I knocked his wife up, but if he go down there and sleep with her, they could say that the child is his. And a lot of Jake do that. A lot of Jake do that. We do that today. We do that today. They got a lot of people who are raising children that ain't theirs. Or a lot of women have babies and the person that they with, that's not the father of their child. A lot of Israel do that. And we've been doing that for quite a long time. And just because David did it, don't make it right. And we're going to see what happens. 
verse 11. And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. So Uriah had a sense of loyalty with him, which probably was killing David all the more because you couldn't just deceive this guy into going to lay with his wife and saying, oh, y'all pregnant. Couldn't do that. And David said unto Uriah, tarry here today also and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And David and when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on, on his bed with the servants of his Lord and went not out, but went not down to his house. So David tried to get this man drunk. You know how you get so drunk, you be like, look, I'm going to just go home and I'm going to just try to sleep this thing off. David, he, Uriah didn't even do that. He didn't even do that. He just, he still slept at David's house. And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, get Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city, he assigned Uriah in, unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David and Uriah the Hittite died also. So this dude set him up to get murdered. He set him up to get murdered. Go to uh, Deuteronomy 27 real quick. He set him up to get murdered. And, and Israel does this too. Contrary to popular belief, Israel does this too. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 24. It said, Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly. Because nobody knew what David was trying to do. Nobody knew. And all the people shall say amen. Verse 25. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say amen. The reward was that woman. That's the reward. And he slayed an innocent, because you're right, didn't do nothing. He slayed an innocent man. And let's see what happens. Though, though people try to use David's transgression for their benefit, let's see what happens. Verse 18. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messengers, saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matter of the war unto the king, and if it be so that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approach ye so nigh unto the city when ye did fight? Know ye not that they would shoot from the wall? Who smote Abimelech, the son of uh, Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of millstone from, from him to the wall that he died in Thebes? Why, th why went ye nigh to the wall? When ye, why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So Joab wanted to make sure that the king understood like back in the day we had messengers that would deliver messages back and forth so Joab didn't personally tell this to David he's like look if if when you tell David what happened because other men died too not just Uriah Uriah and other men of Israel died too so with David's sin other men died as well so that was part one of judgment then he said look just tell him that Uriah the Hittite is dead because that's what he really wanted. And Joab knew this. Then David said unto the messenger, thus shalt thou say unto Joab, let not this thing displease thee for the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage thou him. So David was like, look, it is what it is. Yeah, the mission was accomplished, but you know, you win some, you lose some. The sword, you know, it comes after who it comes after. That's a wicked thing to do. And, and he was content with that. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. 
And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Why did it displease the Lord? Hmm. Because it was murder. He set the man up to get murdered on a battlefield. That's why it was not a righteous thing for David to do. That was not supposed to get done. Let's read on. And the same thing with Bathsheba. She's not innocent in this. She was complicit. When he went and called for the Bathsheba, she went. She didn't say, no, I'm not going up there because I'm married. She said, oh, no, this is David the king. I'm about to go up there. And she laid with him. And it was not rape. It was consensual. And if it was, she knew that she was pregnant. All, if, if he would have went to the house, she would have let him lie with her. And then, then she would oh, look, I'm pregnant. This is your, your baby. Deceitful. Chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the one poor, and the other poor. And the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup. And he lay in his bosom. And drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take his own flock and his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man. And thus was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come unto him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against that man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So, so Nathan came up to him with a parable. He said, look, they had a poor man, they had a rich man. The rich man, he had all of these riches. He had everything he could ever want. The poor man just had this one little lamb. And when there was a, a man to come to the town, the rich man took the poor man's lamb and gave it to him. Now, was that righteous? They was like, no, that's not right at all. This man, he, he, he got to pay for that. Let's see what happened. And Nathan said unto David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if thou had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things. Most high said, look, if you would have just asked me, I would have given you anything you want. I already gave you the kingdom. I gave you Saul's house. I protected you from Saul. I gave you all of these different things. And if you would have asked me, I would have given you more. Let's read on. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? That commandment was what we read in Deuteronomy 27. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You see what he says? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. You killed him with the sword of the children of Ammon. They, they, there's, a, there's a term called uh, suicide by cop that some people do. Some people that want to lose their lives, they... Um, Instead of killing themselves, they'll go and like make a police officer mad enough to shoot them. So it's, it's called suicide by cop. David did murder by the hand of another nation. Because he set the whole thing up. Verse 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. And as the four chapters go on, you're going to see the fruition of what just happened. Uh, verse 12, Thou didst 
Thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord hath also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. So he said, Look, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Howbeit, because of this deed, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Why? Why is that? Go to Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. The judgment, 34 verse 7, the judgment of that child, I mean the judgment of, the judgment of David was that child getting put to death. Watch this. This is why. Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving the iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. Yeah, David got pardoned, but he didn't get cleared. The Most High said he by no means clears the guilty. You will judge, you will get judgment for it. You, you put away your sin, but guess what? Punishment is coming still. So one punishment was the men of Israel dying in battle. And the other one is now your son got to die. And your house is going to have nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble. Verse 13. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. Sorry about that. And Nathan departed into his house, and the Lord struck that child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in, and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went unto him, and raised him from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat the bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How then will he, how will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, and David perceived that the child was dead, therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came in unto the house of the Lord and worshipped and then came into his own house and when he required they set bread before him and he did eat so David did all of the fasting and the prayer before the child died because why he knew that it was of the Lord that this thing was going to happen no amount of prayer was going to bring the child back he's going to say it in a second then said his servants unto him what thing is this that thou hast done Thou hast fast and weep for the child. Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious unto me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return unto me. So David was like, look, I'm content. The Lord said this was going to happen. I didn't want it to happen, but I have no, no, no choice in the matter. All right. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son and called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan, the prophet, and he called his name Jediah, Jedidiah because of the Lord. And Joab fought against Reba, the children of Ammon, and took the royal city. And Joab did send messengers to David and said, I have fought against Reba and have taken the city of waters. Now, therefore, gather the rest of the people together and encamp the city and camp against the city and take it. Lest I take the city and it be called after my name. And David gathered all of the people together and went to Rabba and fought against it and took it and took the king's crown from off his head. And the weight thereof was a talent of gold with the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. And he brought him, 
forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were therein and put them under saws and under harrows of iron and under axes of iron. And he made them pass through the brick kiln. And thus he did unto all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all his people returned to, unto Jerusalem. So David won once again the fight of Ammon. And David made made sure that, you know, he had the things in place that he had. But let me show you something in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Something about David and what David did. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world is when you say, Oh, I'm sorry. And then you go back and do it again. That's the sorrow of the world. That's no sorrow at all. Godly sorrow is when you actually are 100% sorry for the sin that you did, which that's what David did. He fasted. He prayed. You know, he knew that the Lord wasn't going to kill him, but the Lord still killed his child, which in turn is still going to affect you. So when you look at it, David did not just get off scot-free. He was judged, but through that judgment, um, Solomon was able to get born. Solomon was able to be born, and it was all part of the plan of the Lord. There's, there's nothing in there that says that David was going to be the righteous one, and what he did was okay. None of that, no. It, what he did was not okay. Was he forgiven for it? Of course he was. Why? Because the Lord loved David. Can we do that today? No, we cannot. If you get somebody killed... You are a murderer, and you will have to answer for that. Same thing with David. David had to answer through the blood of his child. His child had to die. So through his child dying, he understood, man, the fear of the Lord. Let me show you that real quick. Psalms 119 and 120. Psalms 119 and 120. I know I got to go fast because it's, it's not a whole lot of time. Psalms 119 and 120. Uh, my flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. The fear of the Lord is that godly sorrow that worketh repentance. Because you understand, look, man, I messed up bad. And I know the Lord going to judge me. And I just pray that he don't kill me. Look, whatever needs to happen. Look, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. I apologize. You know what I'm saying? What we can gather from these four chapters is... Yes, David was called, he was the king, he was a very, very mighty man. But David slipped and David fell. David had godly sorrow though. And in that godly sorrow, he was able to not get put to death because if he would have, wouldn't be no Solomon. And through that, wouldn't be no Christ. So the, the, the backup, the master plan behind everything was Christ still had to be born through David's lineage. David was still loved by the Lord. And though he did what he did, David still was forgiven, which shows repentance, which shows that even the, the, the mighty among us can fall and slip and do something that's not right. But did the entire, when, when, when David did this thing, did the entire nation of Israel say, oh man, David did this, I'm gone, I'm leaving? No. Why? Because they had a lot more people that was doing stuff too. So when we look at the history, we start to see that throughout all of our history, and this is our history, throughout all of our history, we see that the only person that was perfect in this world was Christ. He did no sin at all. There was no iniquity found in Christ. But when we look back at the, the prophets and the men that were before us, did they do certain things wrong? Yes. But did they have godly sorrow? Yes. Were they repentant for it? Yes. Did they, did they keep the commandments of the Lord even after they fell? Yes. Like Solomon said in Proverbs, a just man falls seven times, but rise back up again. You have to rise back up again. I wish that I could take questions, but it's really like uh, only a few minutes left. I believe my phone is going to die in a second. So Lord's will, y'all were edified with this. Um, Lord's will next time. We will have uh, more time, but, you know, Sundays is a short day. Uh, be sure to stay tuned tomorrow for 
more of the four chapters a day. All right. Most high in Christ bless y'all. Shalom.